Good job, kids. Anyway, we're starting on the second parable that we we're going to go through five of them. If you remember, this is the second one, and it's the wise and the foolish bridesmaid. So if you would, go along with me here with Matthew chapter 25, 1 through 13. So then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lance and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil in their lamps. But the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused by a shout. Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, We don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourself. But while they were gone to buy the oil, the bridegroom, bri bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast. And the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. They called back, believe me, I don't know. So you too must keep one, for you do not know the day or hour of my return. When you read that, the thing to me that just totally jumps out at you is being prepared. Okay? There is a great wedding feast coming. Are we prepared? Are we prepared for the bridegroom? And that bridegroom for us is Jesus Christ. And essentially what we're going to talk about is, are we prepared for his second coming? Are we prepared? Are we ready for that? Because Christians are like the bridesmaids, awaiting the bridegroom. Some were wise and some were foolish. A lot of people talk about, well, what did that oil represent? That oil represents, I think, a life of works, a life of being prepared. It's interesting that 2 Peter 3.18 says that it just doesn't stop at our faith in Jesus Christ. It didn't stop for those that believed in, in Jesus and repented and turned and, and, and were baptized into Christ. It didn't just stop there. Things changed in their life. And you, you look at, at Peter, 2 Peter 3, 18, it says, Brother, you must grow. He uses this word grow. We're going to grow in what, Peter? We're going to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All glory to him, both now and forever. Amen. You see, this oil represents a life. Not just a lip service to begin your faith, but a faith that continues to walk with him no matter what. A faith of being prepared every day for his second coming. Second Peter says it this way in chapter 1, verse 5, he says, In view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Our response to God's promises are placing our faith in him. And then what he says is supplement that faith with generous provision of moral excellence. And moral excellence with knowledge. And knowledge with self-control. And self-control with patient endurance. And patient endurance with godliness. And godliness with brotherly affection. Brotherly affection with love for everyone. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. What he's telling Peter is, is, is telling these Christians, he's saying, listen, it is going to take a life. It is going to take a life change when we become part of a Christian family. It's going to be a, a, a time where we, we look at ourselves and assess ourselves daily. It's going to be a time where we are all prepared for His second coming. And not only do we prepare for His second coming by, by, by placing our faith in Him, but our life is going to be a life of works for Him every day. We look and we live according to that. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live. 
Peter's telling him, this is what's going to happen in the end. So because of this, this is the kind of life we need to live. Looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire. The elements will melt away into flame. But we, Christians, are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth. He has promised. A world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, when we're looking forward to the second coming of Christ, it says make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. The coming of the Lord is going to be a blessing for everyone that is prepared for it. Everybody who, who is prepared for that day is ready for that day. Their lamps are full. They have plenty of oil in their reservoir for that day. 2 Peter 1 says it this way. He says, so dear brothers and sisters, he says, work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen. Do these things. And look, he says, and you'll never fall. Then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible is, is, is full of what we should do. It doesn't say we're working our way to heaven. It just says that believers that truly have placed their faith in him want to work for him. They want to do things for him. They're in a marriage with Christ, and they're just there saying, what do I need to do? It's called growing in the grace and knowledge. Wisdom, listen to this. Wisdom works hard and keeps our lamps full of oil. Foolishness, on the other hand, kicks back. And begins to, 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 to center on self and more of what we think and, 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 and more of what we want to do. Instead of saying, I'm called to live this kind of life, we say, it's my privilege and right to live this kind of life. And when they're in contrast, one is saying, I'm filling the oil up, and the other is saying, I've got enough oil to make it. I think I'll just go ahead and put it on. The Bible's very plain. I think in, in, in Proverbs 1 7, it says it this way the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Now, listen, fools despise, despise wisdom and instruction. A fool will look and go, I'm going to do it my way. And oh, how hard that can be. This is what I want to do, but this is not what God called me to do. This is what I want to do, but this is not God's plan for my life. And those two can come in conflict. And Jesus is saying, those that line up with my will are prepared for that day. He tells us to prepare ourselves. Jesus says it this way, be prepared. And he says, and keep your lamps lit. I like it. Be prepared and keep your lamps lit. If you noticed in the parable, it wasn't just about lighting the lamp. It was about having enough oil to keep the lamp lit. Very important. Very important in the life of a believer. One shouldn't just trust in your previous accomplishments like the foolish virgins did. They, they, they had oil in their lamps, but they were not prepared for that day. He says, then the five ones ask the others, please give us some of your oil. Why? Because our lamps are going to go out. I'm not going to make it. I can remember forgetting but fuel in a car and have a 20 mile drive. There's a lot of prayers that go up when that happens. You ever notice that? You, if you're not even a praying person, you become a praying person. Thinking, God, I know there's not enough fuel in this vehicle to make it town, but I know you got the power to get me there anyway. This happens in a lot of people's lives. The oil is there, but you know what? Why build on that? Why well, care about that? The story that I want to use today to point to point our mind in a direction of it's not where we start, but where we finish is a story of Saul. One of the saddest stories I think in the Bible is a story of Saul. If you look into the Word of God and you see the writings of Saul, and you go, "Wow, what a great godly!" Man. 
Want to start with the first story? In first King story. Talks about Saul. It says, Now, O oh Lord my God, you have made me king. This is Solomon. David's son. And so my father David, but I am like a little child who doesn't know his way around. And here I am in the midst of your own chosen people, a nation so great and numerous it cannot be counted. Give me an understanding heart so that I can govern your people well and know the difference between right and wrong. For who by himself is able to govern this people, this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for wisdom. So God replied, because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice and have not asked for a long life or wealth or the death of your enemies, I will give you what you have asked for. I will give you a wise and understanding heart such as no one else has ever has, has, has had or ever will have. I will also give you what you want, what, what you did not ask for, riches and fame. No other king in the world will be compared to you for the rest of your life. Now let's look at verse 14. Very important. And if you follow me and obey my decrees and my commandments, as your father David did, I will give you a long life. When I look at the Bible, I look at the writings of Solomon, I read some of those writings, and go, wow, what a great man. What a great man. And you go along and you think of those men of faith, and you think, wow, what did Solomon's life really consist of? How great a man was it? And all of a sudden you think of the greatness, those that displayed the faith, and you walk on over to Hebrews. And you walk over to the wall of faith, people. You know them, dogs, right? From Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, all those. Go find Solomon's name. Go take some time, you won't find it again. And you'll say, wait a minute, stop right there. Did in, in, in this verse, or in these verses, talk about the greatness of Solomon? Didn't he just share? This is one of the wisest people that ever lived. Don't we read books that he wrote? What happened to Solomon? Where did he go wrong? What happened in his life that changed his life? That's where we turn to 1 Kings chapter 11. Very, very sad. Beginning with verse 3. He says, He had 700 wives of the well birth and 300 companies. And in fact, they did turn his heart away from the Lord. In Solomon's old age, it says, they turned his heart to worship other gods instead of being completely faithful to the Lord, his God. And his father David had been. He says, Solomon worshiped the Astra and the goddess of the Sidonians. It says, and Moloch, the detestable God of the Ammonites. In this way, Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He refused to follow the Lord completely as his father David had done. On the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, he even built a pagan shrine for Shiva. This is the detestable God of Moloch. And another shrine for Moloch, the detestable God of the Ammonites. Solomon built such shrines for all his foreign wives to use for burning incense and sacrifice unto their God. The Lord was very angry with Solomon, for his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him once. He had warned Solomon specifically about worshiping other gods, but Solomon did not listen to the Lord's command. So now the Lord said to him, Since you have not kept my covenant, and have, not dis and have disobeyed my decrees, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your servants. But for the sake of your father David, I will not do this while you are still alive. I will take the kingdom away from your son. And even so, I will not take away the entire kingdom. I will let him be the king of one tribe for the sake of my servant David. And for the sake of Jerusalem, I chose to say. He wasn't listening in that. Because a lot of people were talking to him. Well, don't you think Paul was saying he doesn't talk much about Paul? After this story, it, it, it came where, where, where he leaves God in his old age, it says. And, and embraces the, the pagan shrines. What we may look at and we may say is, boy, did he not fill his lamp early on. But that's what it is. No oil was, was ever purchased beyond that. It was just a life of unfaithfulness. Paul tells it this way as a believer. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already received, reached perfection. 
But look, I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I'm not cheated, but I focus on this one thing. I forget the past. And, and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. You see, the apostle Paul understood exactly what it was going to take. He said, it's not going to take that first commitment, but it's going to take a life of commitment. Not just a one-time commitment, not just a one-time God give me wisdom, but a life that is lived in wisdom. It was easy for the virgins that were foolish to go to the ones and say, please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. We weren't prepared for that day. We weren't ready for that day. But the others replied, we're going to have enough oil for all of us. It says, go and shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. And it says, then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. We're not going to go ahead and go to, to, to our family member of faith and say, I'm so glad you're my family member, but because of your faith, I'm going to be prepared for that day. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't. Proverbs 9, 12 says it this way. If you become wise, you will be the one to benefit. If you scorn wisdom, you will be the one to suffer. You will be judged independently. Some, some people are born in a family of faith. Some people are blessed with that. And, and they, their grandmother and their grandpa and their mom and their dad were great Christians. And you would like to think that they could impute Christianity upon their son or daughter, but it doesn't work that way, does it? It just doesn't. The scripture says, not because of their oil, it's going to be yours. It prepares us for that day. It says, and remember that the Heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of Him during your time here as temporary residents. The scripture here says, we're temporary residents. Be prepared to meet your Creator. Be ready. Have those lamps full. Have that extra oil ready. In other words, live a life every day for Him. You can never do enough for the one that's done everything for you. Matthew 25, 10 through 12 says, But while they were gone by a oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. Now we should look at verse 12. But he called back to leave it unprepared. Unprepared for his return means there's no second chance. There's not a purgatory that we go through. There's not some great second chance to, to, to be saved. It's a one-time thing. The salvation is not. Luke 21, 34 to 35 says it this way. Watch out. Don't let your hearts be dulled by carousing and drunkenness and by the worries of this life. Don't let that day catch you unaware what day, God. The day of your return. Like a trap. He says, for the day, look closely, will come upon every one living on the earth. That day is coming without a doubt. What is that scripture trying to tell us? He's saying, maintain a state of preparedness. Maintain that state. Be careful to not let this world occupy it. <coughs> not the worldly lusts, the lusts of the flesh, lusts of the eyes, and the pride of life take you over. Listen to what Paul says as he says, he gets ready for that day. This is instead, I discipline my body and bring it under strict control so that after preaching to others, I myself will not be disqualified. That word discipline is a word that we don't always like to hear. I think it's interesting how the NIV says it. Now, sometimes you look at different versions, and I think it's great. The NIV does a very great, great interpretation of this. In other words, they said this is the way the Greeks said it. He says, no, I strike a blow to my body. 
and make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. I strike a blow to my body. Do you, know what the, you know what the picture is here? If you look up that Greek word, you know what it says? To bruise your body. Now, we know he's not talking about the physical. <coughs> we know he's talking about the spiritual. We know it requires a discipline. It's not always a, I want him to do that thing. You understand that as Christian? It's not always a, I want him to do that. I just want to do the things I want to do in life. My feelings are, <laughs> that's not what God called me to do. Sometimes it's in direct competition to what you want to do. And that's why Paul says, listen, I'm a preacher of the word, but I've got to be careful. Because even though I love Jesus and I'm out preaching with Jesus, I need to make sure to have my life ready. I need to make sure to prepare myself. I need to make sure to go get the oxygen mask on myself first so I can put on the others. You understand that? You understand that? It's very important. Paul says, I've got to recognize that. Paul told Timothy this. He says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but a power of love and of self-discipline. Of power and love and self-discipline. You know what that self-discipline word says? It's, it's sound mind. That's what the Apostle Paul tells Timothy. Be a sound mind. What does it look like to be a sound mind? Now, I, I, I wrote this down because I think it's very important. If you, if you look at that scripture, go back up here. Let's, I want to back up to the scripture. That was there before. Right, it says, Paul has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity. Now, I think we all understand as Christians, there's something that happens at our new birth. Do you remember what happens at our new birth? Outside of our sins being cleansed? Anybody can say it. God's put something inside of you. Always God gave us the Holy Spirit, and that Holy Spirit will begin to work with our spirit. And the reason the Holy Spirit is given to us as a believer is because God knows one thing. Without him, you and I can screw it all up. Here. Right? I mean, exactly. We're going, I know it. And so we know today you and I possess the Holy Spirit for that. For that reason. Now, we know that in Romans it tells us how that Holy Spirit works. How it works with our spirit. Because we know that in Galatians, that we're not going to live by the flesh. Or we're not going to live by the Spirit because we're going to live by the flesh. Once we allow that Holy Spirit to take over. But we allow the Holy Spirit to tell our minds. This is what self control is. This is what being a sound mind is. We allow the Holy Spirit to tell our minds. In other words, the Holy Spirit is in. God's not going to impute anything. He's just going to say, Are you going to allow my spirit? Don't we allow the Holy Spirit to tell our minds what we need to do and where we need to go? I want to stop right there. We are going to allow, we are going to be self controlled. To be prepared is to be self controlled. To be prepared is to, to, to buffet your body daily, it says. What does that look like? That is allowing the Holy Spirit to change our mind. It's called the renewing of our mind. And then we'll be able to test. God's will for our life. And it says where we need to go, or what we need to do, and where we need to go instead, instead, here's the big instead, of allowing our minds to chase every thought of you. <laughs> mind in I, I ask myself why. Who's in control of my mind? Here's the whole thing. You see, what happens is this whole idea of chasing every thought or feeling, Satan is alive and well. And so there are many thoughts and there are many feelings that can come into our life and we think, whoa, here's a thought and a feeling. Probably the Holy Spirit gave it to me. And we don't test that. It is very important to understand that I've got to 
be a Holy Spirit filled person. That I've got to live by the Spirit and not by the flesh. And so this is what happens when we're self-controlled. This is what happens when we go through a discipline. Man, I don't want to go through that discipline. I don't want that. We talked about the importance this morning in class of training. People, we undergo as Christians training. We talked about how you train a lab, and it was funny, all the kids had labs, and we found out also how not to train a lab. Our dog is ridiculous because it's not gone under any training. Sometimes you may go to Walmart and you think that kid is the spawn of Satan. <laughs> You're laughing because that's happened, hasn't it? And I'm saying, Kevin will say, maybe the parents are one of these. Who's never in training these things? Most of the time, train your child the way you should go and pray your heart. is a cold thing. It, re it requires discipline. There's going to be self-control. And I know I'm saying something that is so foreign to this world today. And every day that I live a little bit longer, I'm thinking, it becomes more and more boring. Discipline. Self-control. For parents for the second coming. It not only fills our lamps with oil, but it has us enough oil to make it to the end. What a tremendous parable. And as we look at that parable, we say, God, help me all. God, we are thankful for your parables. There are so many things we can say for parables today. I just want to concentrate on being prepared. Being prepared and preparing myself for discipline. Self-control is so very important. Having my mind, the mind of the Spirit, and not the mind of myself. God, be with everyone here today. I pray everybody's a believer today. If they're not, God, let them be a believer. But most importantly, we look at the Scripture today. Help us all.